Hello, everyone uh, out there on the internet and on, on stream and on YouTube when you watch this uh, video later after it's, after it's been recorded. Uh, my name is Guy Royce. I am the uh, self-proclaimed czar of the Columbus JS, which is the JavaScript meetup that we have here in Columbus. Uh, I'm here tonight with Jeff Blankenberg and a host of attendees um, to talk about, um, well, to talk about his talk. Uh, Jeff's got a great talk on Alexa. He's a developer advocate uh, with the Alexa team at Amazon. And so uh, I, I think we could say that he's an expert, even though he probably hates to be called an expert because it says so much without saying anything at all. Right, I completely uh, agree. So uh, uh, we are, we're on Zoom and we're also on Twitch. So if you're on Twitch and you're watching, um, Jeff is watching Twitch chat and, and he streams, so he's used to doing that. Uh, but I'll be watching it as well. And if I see anything I'll, I'll, and he misses it, I'll let him know. If you're here on uh, the Zoom with us um, and you've got a question, uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. Uh, you know, at an appropriate time, or put it in the Twitch chat, or I mean, or, or put it in the uh, the Zoom chat, either or, and we will uh, get that. Make sure Jeff hears it or knows about it. And uh, yeah, that's what I've got. Um, so Jeff, this is all yours. When Jeff's done, we'll uh, just do a quick uh, what's coming up next month and uh, hang out and uh, shoot the breeze. So, Perfect. Thanks for coming, Jeff. Thank you for having me, Mr. Royce. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so welcome everybody. Uh, I think the way that I'm going to do this, would you prefer, Guy, actually, I'm going to ask you a, a logistical question before we get started. Do you want me to share my screen or do you want, like, I can just do this. Is it better to share my screen? You're muted. Sorry. Yes, I did mute myself. <laughs> uh, whichever is easier for you. Um, okay, well, th This is easier. It lets me jump back and forth easily without having to fumble with Zoom. So works for me. Okay, I'm going to do this. Um, all right, awesome. So um, one of the other things that I want to make I make sure I mention is that in the chat, um, or even on Zoom, I have the Zoom chat, I have the Twitch chat, I have the voice stuff open, I can hear you if you talk on Zoom. Um, I'm happy to be interrupted and ask, answer questions. I would much rather spend this hour answering all of your questions and making sure that you guys know exactly what you need to do and know and, you know, think about when you go through voice, uh, voice experiences than for me to stand up here and give a presentation that I've given 25 times. So uh, I would much rather answer your questions. And so if you have them, don't hesitate to ask. I would, I would love to be able to help you guys understand any of this. But in the meantime, let's talk a little bit about uh, Amazon Alexa. And before I can do that, obviously, I have to talk about me. So um, you guys can find me literally everywhere as at Jeff Blankenberg. Um, this is just a smattering of places that I am, but um, I have somehow found a way to claim that username everywhere. So uh, you can definitely find me any place you are. Uh, I probably am also. And uh, as, as Guy mentioned, I do a lot of streaming. So almost every single weekday, uh, I am on Twitch, again, as at Jeff Blankenberg, and I'm building stuff every day. So from about 10 to noon Eastern every day, uh, I get on, I build stuff, I work on Alexa skills, I do a lot of Node, um, and a lot of data persistence, all that kind of stuff. So uh, if you guys want to tune in, drop a follow over there, come join me. Uh, it's a good community of people and we build a lot of cool stuff like chatbots and Alexa and things like that. So, all right, let's 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 get into the real content though. So the first thing I wanna talk about is what is an Alexa skill? Because I think this is something that uh, a lot of developers realize, oh, I have a, I have one of those devices in my house and it does cool stuff. I can play my music or I can turn on my lights. Um, but a lot of people don't realize that there's this entire ecosystem the same way that you think about on your phone, right? There's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of apps at this point. Uh, I think there's well over 100,000 at least. Uh, and this is just a, a sampling of some of the, the things that are on there. You can see there's Jeopardy and CNN and Twitter and Uber and Domino's Pizza, all sorts of stuff. Um, and all of these function very much like the apps that you have on your phone. The only difference is, is that you have to talk to them. So if you want to, for example, order a pizza from Domino's, I'm going to try very hard not to say the A word, by the way, because I know I'll set off everybody's devices that might be nearby. So uh, you'll just have to understand that I'm purposely going out of my way to not say that. Headphones are smart, guy, very smart. Uh, so you can say things like open Domino's and it'll just pop that skill open for you. And then you can um, you can set it up to pair with your Domino's.com account. And then in the future, you can do things like give me my easy order, which is that thing your family always gets on Friday night, right? It's the same order every time. It's a cheese pizza for the kids and something interesting for the adults and maybe some breadsticks. Well, you can, you can save your easy order and just tell the skill like, hey, we're ready for a thing. And it'll, it'll be like, all right, cool. Your pizza will be there in 25 minutes. Um, that kind of stuff is really possible and really awesome when you think about just being able to yell that out in the kitchen without having to get your phone out and log into stuff and do all those kinds of things. So that's what a skill is. That's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. And I know that some of the folks that are here um, watching 
have you even built some skills? So uh, make sure you mention in the chat if you have stuff people you want to try or whatever, um, mention it in the chat. That's a good opportunity for people to see what you're working on. Okay, so let's talk about what it goes into building a skill because one of the first things that might be obvious to you is that voice skills don't have the same kind of interfaces that you see when you build stuff for web or for mobile, right? Or desktop. Um, you don't have physical buttons. You don't have text boxes. You don't have radio buttons. You don't have all that stuff that we normally think about when we build interfaces. All you have is the user's voice. And we have to think about how that works. And so uh, I know you're staring at a DVD player right now, but there's a really good reason for that. Uh, and I think it's a good illustration of how we think about the interface for a human's voice talking to a computer. Now, none of us probably have a voice enabled DVD player. In fact, that would seem kind of silly, I think, um, because you don't really interact with them much or maybe you have a remote control. Um, but what I want you to imagine for a moment is that you have been tasked at work with building a DVD player that is completely voice operated. And so one of the first exercises you'll do is think about, okay, what does the interface look like? What are people gonna say to this thing? And so you can look at the face of this and get a pretty good clue, right? There's an eject button. There's a play and pause button. Uh, there's a power button. On some more advanced DVD players, you might even have fast forward or rewind. You might have a stop button. Um, some DVD players are super advanced. They have five or 10 discs in them. Um, I, I even had a carousel way, way back in the day that held like 50. Um, and so you had buttons to navigate those discs and things too. So you can think about all of those things would be controls that you might find on a remote controller right on the face of the device. And when we think about building for voice, we think about what the user's intent is. And so that, that word intent is going to become really important as we go through all of this. Uh, and it's one of the things that I really like to key in on to make sure people understand, because if you don't get the concept of an intent, the rest of this gets a little harder. So the intents for this DVD player might be play, pause, stop, turn off, eject, right? We'll just, we'll live with that small subset. And so as we think about a user being able to say stuff, our first initial prototype might be just those words. But eventually we wanna build it so that people can think about saying it the way they talk. They might say it's showtime or play the movie, right? Instead of just saying the word play. Uh, or again, in that carousel situation, they might even say something like play Shawshank Redemption. And so now you need to know, not only do they wanna play, but you know exactly which movie they wanna to play too. So all of these things start to play together, but at the end of the day, whether they say play or Shawshank Redemption or Star Wars or whatever it is, they mean play. They, their intention is to play a movie. Uh, in the same way, if they say stop or turn off or quit or exit or whatever, all of those things mean for the user, they mean stop. I wanna stop the thing that's happening. And so that's the really important piece of this. We wanna think about what are those individual intentions, the intents that a user has when they use our voice software. And so, Play is one, stop is another, and we're gonna build out these separate intents as a way to manage and control how we handle all of the interactions that happen inside of our skill. And it also gives us the, the ability to push back and say, I'm sorry, that's not something I know how to do. As an example, you would never ask your DVD player to transfer your bank balance, at least I hope you wouldn't. Um, and you wouldn't expect your DVD player to do that. There's kind of this built-in innate scope in your mind about what a DVD player should and shouldn't do. And so we would never generally ask our DVD player to transfer our bank balance, but if we have a more vague skill, a more vague application that could do a bunch of stuff, we need to be really clear and concise with our users about what our scope is and what it isn't. Um, and we only provide intents that handle the is part. So let's get into some diagrams and talk about how this whole scenario plays together. The first thing that I wanna start with is the person on the left. You can see the little, uh, um, I can't think of, uh, the, we'll call it a meeple. The, the meeple there on the left-hand side that has the speech bubble. And that person is talking to their device where it goes up to audio. So they say something to their device like um, play Shawshank Redemption. And so what happens on the device, and this is something, if you guys haven't thought about the technology that lives inside one of these, I also wanna be really clear and transparent about this because I think there's a lot of, suspicion about things and how it works and is it recording and all that. So I'll, I'll try to cover all that stuff too. But we talk to the device and what happens is you have a wake word. And I mentioned, I'm not going to say that a name, um, but it could also be echo or computer uh, or Amazon. You can change it to any of those four. Uh, but when you say that word, there is an onboard engine that is listening specifically and only for that word. Um, and so it's trained specifically to listen for that thing. And when it does, it turns the ring on your device uh, and starts listening to everything else that you're going to say. So it's not doing anything. It's not listening. It's not recording. It's not sending anything to the cloud until you tell it to wake up. And when you do tell it to wake up by using that wake word, 
um, then the blue ring on top turns on to let you know that, hey, I am now recording and it's going to listen to the rest of the stuff that you say. So if you say the wake word and then you say play Shawshank Redemption, what it does is it captures that audio file and it ships it off to the cloud. There's no processing happening locally on the device. Uh, all it is really is a microphone and a speaker. And so it takes the recording that it makes and it ships that off to the cloud. And the first thing we do is speech recognition. Uh, if you guys haven't played with audio to speech recognition, the basic concept is it takes that waveform that it's uh, created, it compares it against a library of what we call phonemes for the specific language that you indicated you're speaking in. So for the example, English, there's a bunch of sounds that we make with our language um, that are also in many other languages, but they, they change from language to language. Uh, and especially as you get into more adventurous things like um, Chinese or Japanese uh, or, or even uh, German, there's different sounds and different things that, that move through these languages. Um, and so it compares your waveform to the library of phonemes, which are small sounds in words, uh, and translates that down to text. It also uses machine learning to do all of this because it wanna make sure that it heard the words properly, but the, they also make sense in the context of what you were saying. Uh, and if you've ever watched a speech to text engine happen, you'll see oftentimes it'll put one word in place and then realize as it looks at the context that something needs to change. Um, that's what's happening here behind the scenes is it's trying to formulate what sentence or phrase did you say based on the waveform that you provided. Finally, and this is my favorite part, the last step is natural language understanding because we need to take that one step further. It's not good enough to just know what the words are that you said. We need to boil it down to that intent. What was your intention? What are you trying to do? Uh, and so this natural language understanding, the way I like to explain this is if you've ever been in a relationship in your life, you know that what you say is not always what you mean. And a good example of this is any conversation I've had with my wife, right? Hey, is everything okay? I'm fine. Well, I can guarantee you you're not fine. But if I looked just verbatim at the words that she used, I would interpret that to mean that she's fine. But I can tell because of natural language understanding, I can use sentiment analysis, I can use all sorts of stuff uh, to in my own personal onboard sentiment analysis, my human sentiment analysis, to say, hey, actually, I don't think she's fine. Maybe we should dig in deeper on this, or maybe I should give her some space, right? In either case, um, that's an example of natural language understanding happening with humans. The same thing happens here uh, on a lesser scale, right? Because we're talking about machine learning. But this natural language understanding engine is trying to figure out, based on the words you said and the sentiment that you used, which of the intents available for this skill did you mean to use? And so it maps all of that stuff down. This all happens behind the scenes. I don't have to do anything. All of this heavy lifting uh, is done completely by the Alexa cloud before it ever even gets to my code. So all of that stuff happens. It boils it down to an intent. It says, oh, by the way, um, you have a slot. We'll talk about slots in a minute. But you have a slot that they filled in with the words Shawshank Redemption. So I'm going to give you that stuff too. So when we get to the request part where we're getting to my service, the request is going to hand off to me, hey, here's an anonymized user ID. Here's a bunch of other stuff about their device that you may or may not want to know. Um, here's the intent they wanted. The intent in this case is the play intent, let's say. And by the way, they had this slot and the slot value they gave me was Shawshank Redemption. So I take that information, this user, that intent, this slot value, and I say, oh, they want to watch Shawshank Redemption. Okay. So then my service, my code, this is just, um, this is serverless. It's node running in Lambda for me, but it can be whatever service you want to have running wherever you want it to be running. Um, I, I can't recommend not looking into Lambda on AWS only because it's as close to free as you'll ever find. Um, in fact, I haven't found a way to spend money yet on Lambda and I've tried. So <clears throat> it's, um, it's a really good way to think about this. And we have a lot of mechanisms set up and I'll show you in a minute um, to set it up and make it all run. So as we go through all of that, we get to our service and now our code takes that stuff, interprets it, does whatever we wanna do, make some calls, call some APIs, look some things up does some calculations, whatever our code needs to do. And then at the end of the day, all we're doing is formulating a JSON document that we pass back to the service. Uh, and that in that document is what do we want Alexa to say to the user the next time? Um, do we have any session attributes that we want to save? Like, hey, we want to remember what this user's done. So we're going to pass some session attributes through so that the next time they talk to us, we know what happened. We can remember things about the user. Um, but we pass all that stuff back. That goes back through our text-to-speech engine. Uh, we're back in that cloud there in the center. Alexa turns the text that you provided into speech, and that comes back to the user back through their audio device. But you can see there's a path along the bottom, which is visual. And uh, as you guys can see behind me here, I have a bunch of devices. Many of them have screens on them. And 
you can pass visual information, you can pass really rich things, animations, all sorts of cool stuff on the screens. Uh, and in the Alexa app itself, you can also pass something we call cards, which are really kind of like static content. Kind of think of it like a like a, a tweet, right? You have a little box inside the app and it's like an updated kind of timeline um, and you can pass information in there. So it's really useful when somebody asks about the weather, you can pass all the weather right into their Alexa app and then um, they don't have to continue asking or looking it up anywhere. They just have it in the app ready to go. Um, so Will asked the question, how do you store state in a Lambda? Well, the state itself, you don't actually store. Lambda is serverless, right? It's just some code that runs. Um, but what I do, the service that I use, um, I teeter between these two, but I tend to lean more. I'm sure you guys have seen or used Airtable before. Uh, I tend to lean on Airtable a little bit just because it has the API and everything kind of wrapped around it already for me. So it's really easy for me to make JSON calls in and out. Um, but being an uh, Amazon shill, I also have to say that I use DynamoDB a, a bit. Um, but I'm, I've also came from the Microsoft world, so I've run through SQL servers or whatever. But no, I'm storing my state somewhere else. So the, the key to this, though, uh, and oh, Redis might be a thing. Maybe we should talk about that. <laughs> um, but the, the thing that I want to say about storing state is that there's two ways to manage state. If you need long running state, so I need to remember stuff about a user forever, then yeah, you're going to go with something like Redis or Airtable or whatever data or service you really like. It doesn't matter. Um, as long as you can call it from Node, you, you should be able to use it, no problem. However, um, for short-term stuff, like what was the question I just asked them, right? This is a really good example. Um, the session object is a great place to store that short-term stuff, and that's what Simon's getting to, is the, the Alexa session object is what I was mentioning. I can pass data into that cloud that is my session data, and because it's called session data, that should be obvious, it exists for the session. So as long as the user is talking and we continue to have our conversation, it will continue to exist. But if they quit my skill or they walk away from their device and it decides to end the session for them, um, then that session data is all gone. So what I tend to do, because a lot of the data that I build in my skills needs to be persisted long-term, um, I tend to persist almost every time that I do anything anyway. Uh, and then when the user comes back in, I go rehydrate uh, and bring that data back. So uh, it's a little, it's a little heavier, a little chunkier service, I guess, in the way that I do it. Um, but it assures me that I have all the data I need every single time, and I'm not losing anything along the way. So that's a quick tour of kind of how the technical structure of all this stuff works. Um, what I'd like to do now, if you guys don't mind, we have, I think we have some time. It's, uh, it's seven eighteen. I thought this would take about twenty minutes. We'll do about twenty minutes of demo-ish stuff, um, and then we'll just do questions at the end, if that's uh, if that's okay with everybody. So my, my next slide says, okay, let's do this, which means get out of the slides, Jeff. Let's go open a code editor and do something. Uh, where did it go? There it is. Okay. So this is VS Code. Um, I'm going to do this all from the command line. But actually, before I do that, let's, uh, let's go here. Um, I want to go to developer.amazon.com. I think it's important for you guys to at least see this. Uh, but I'm going to do everything from the command line just because I prefer that. But let's go look at, uh, let's go look at this one. This is good. So this is a skill I'm working on that's basically a voice casino. Uh, and what you can see in here, if I open up my interaction model, I mentioned those intents that we're talking about. So as I think about my casino, you guys can't see this, I just realized. There we go, now you can see it. Um, so I'm in a skill, this is in the developer portal and um, developer.amazon.com. I'm in the intent section here. And the first thing that I want you to see are what are the intents that I have for this skill? So you can say I have, these are built-in ones, the ones that start with Amazon, but I have cancel and help and stop and repeat. These are things that users commonly say, and this is as close to a universal interface as we have. Um, these are required. You can see that those are listed over here. Um, cancel, help, and stop have to be provided by, in every skill. And it's because we want users to be able to reliably navigate with their voice the things that they're doing. So those are always there, but the ones that I've created, the ones that are custom, these are the ones that are really important. So I have user account intent or start slots intent. Remember, this is a casino. So this intent means, hey, they've indicated to me that they wanna start a game of slots. Uh, this means they wanna start a game of video poker. They've indicated they wanna start a game of roulette. Uh, down here, we have, some, uh, we have them checking their balance. So if they wanna know anything about how many credits they have or whatever, uh, they can do that here. Uh, if they want to spin the wheel and roulette, I have an intent for that. If they want to deal a hand of poker. So they're in that middle state. If you guys have ever played video poker, you're dealt five cards. Uh, do you guys say my screen is too blurry? I can, uh, I can try blowing it up. But it feels like 
I'm, I'm broadcasting at a pretty high resolution. Um, can you, can anybody else confirm? Are we having? It, it is, it's blurry on my side too. It could be Zoom. Interesting. Okay. Well, I apologize. I'll, I'll just blow things up. That's okay. Um, yeah. So I have, yeah. <laughs> so I have, I have all of these intents for checking my balance and um, checking summaries of how many bets do I have on the table right now? Um, what are the pay tables? If you've ever walked up to a slots a slot machine, um, they pay differently depending on which fruit you get or whatever, right? So this is this lets me find out what that pay table looks like. And then there's a leaderboard so I can see how I'm doing against my friends and stuff like that. So these are the intents. And if I open one up, like start slots, you can see that I have a bunch of what we call sample utterances that are the things that I think represent the words humans might use to do this. So they might say 10 on slots or slots for 10 or bet 10 coins on slots, right? There's, there's some variation here. Uh, play slots for 10. Um, what I don't want to do, and this is something that we as developers try to get really explicit about, is we forget that there's a machine learning engine sitting behind all of this helping us. And so we tend to try to come up with every possible permutation of the ways people might speak. You don't need to do that. I generally recommend if you're between 10 and 15 different utterances for an intent, you're probably good. Unless you have wildly varying things that you think people might say, then include those. But 10 to 15 things generally is, is the rule of thumb for me. If you if you have more than 100, you're doing something wrong. Like you've you've gone down a bad path because you're you're clearly spending way too much time thinking about all the ways people will say things and not trusting the engine. So you can see the number of utterances I have for these 10, 14, 7, 9. Um, you don't have to go crazy on this stuff. But so I have these intents. Um, all of this points out to a Lambda function um, that handles all of these requests. And I, I can show you what this looks like as well before we get started building one, because I want to I show you that too. So if I say, open the chat so you know, this should work. I haven't checked on this in a little while, so maybe the code's broken. Who knows? Welcome to the chat so you know. There we go. That's it? That's all you're going to give me? Oh, I started building a new one. That's right. So we don't have any real functionality. I apologize. Um, but you can see that just by opening my skill, I have this nice um, terminal here. I can see the JSON input. So this is that document that gets passed into my code that I mentioned earlier. So you can see down here, it shows me what kind of device I have, what the, the anonymous user ID is. It's consistent every time they come in, but it's anonymous. Um, lots and lots of stuff about their device. The further down I go, this is hard when I'm all zoomed in like this. Um, you can see that down, when I get down here to the bottom, the request is what's really interesting about what the user wanted to do. And so in this case, it's a launch request. And uh, I know like what locale they're in. I know what timestamp it had. I think if I can say something like, hello, will that work? What will that do? You just triggered hello world intent. Perfect. So in this case, you can see that I have a hello world intent built into this skill. And so it recognizes that, hey, this was an intent request. And the intent that the user hit was the hello world intent. This is the thing that you will see over and over and over. I got an intent request and it was this intent. And if there was any information passed through, then I would also get some slot values. Um, but I don't have anything that robust set up here. In fact, let's go, let's go look at a different skill and I can show you uh, something that is more robust before we get into building something. So with this one, this is a, this is a trivia game that I, I'm working on getting published right now. This has sound effects and stuff too, so um, it might get noisy. TKO trivia, where the questions are impossible and the achievements are meaningless. There we go. What should we do this time? So I can do things like, uh, and I'll turn this on. You can see that there, this is the display stuff. So you can see that I, get, I can do all sorts of nice animations and really rich graphics on top of all this, and this would show on the devices that are behind me, but I get to see all this stuff in my debug as well. Uh, but let's let's do a trivia question. We'll do this in the chat. If anybody has any um, proclivities to knowing the answer to questions, we'll choose technology. That'll be fun. Let's see what we get. If I zoom out, you can see that it actually has like a text box over here on the left. Oops. It looks like you don't oh, own the technology right. category yet. Would you like to unlock it? So this gets, you get to see some in-scale purchasing here. Um, this Unlock is Unlock all of the product. technology questions. And, and now we'll get a technology question. Please say your four digit code to confirm the purchase. Really, a really tough pin. All right, so it should say, hey, now you own it. And then it should ask me a trivia question. Great. Your order is complete and I've emailed <laughs> you a receipt. Thanks for your purchase. Your support makes it possible to continue growing our library of questions. This is a fun technology question for you. 
You've got one on your phone, and you may have one in your car. What does GPS stand for? Now, I would bet all of us know the answer to this question. Um, but you'd be surprised the number of people that know GPS but have no idea what the words stand for. Uh, yeah, John nailed it. Global positioning system. So let's let's type that in. Okay. What is your answer? Global positioning system. Let's see if she thinks I'm right. Nice. Cha-ching. You got that one right. The answer to that question was global positioning system. What should we do next? There we go. So that's that's the experience of playing through a skill. But what we saw is each time, every single time that we talked to the skill, what we were doing was hitting another intent. And so you can see in this one, this is a much more robust request. I hit an intent request. I'll try to blow this up for you again. Um, I hit an intent request. Let me get down here to the bottom. So I had an intent request. You can see that the answer intent was hit. So I'm answering the question. And then I have this slot. The name of the slot is answer. And I can see that the value that the user gave me was global positioning system. Now there's a bunch of other nice stuff that falls into this, like what we call entity resolution. This is where it actually looks at the values that I've provided as the answer. And it says, uh, hey, look at this. One of the values that you provided as the potential answer was global positioning system. And they match that. So what this tells me immediately is that, oh my gosh, they got the right answer because it, if they matched one of my answers, well, the only slot value happened to be the right answer. So if they matched it, I know they got the answer right. Uh, and if they didn't, then I know they got the answer wrong. And I can use that as a mechanism inside my skill. But if we were doing something different, like I have another skill that's a Star Wars database, you can ask it about any planet, vehicle, race, um, weapon, all sorts of stuff, droids. It's got, it's got all the answers. And so if you say, you know, who is C-3PO, or a better example is, um, tell me about Skywalker, right? Not only does it get a match, the problem now is that it got a list of a couple of people, right? We got Shmi Skywalker, Anakin's mom, you've got Anakin Skywalker, you've got Luke. Um, I, I won't spoil any movies for anyone else, but that is, uh, those three specifically come back as entity resolutions. And in that case, I'm not trying to guess which one you got right. What I'm trying to do instead is say, oh, well, there's more than one possibility for the thing they said. So I'm going to prompt them and say, oh, I heard you say Skywalker, but did you mean Shmi or Anakin or Luke? And then I get the user to say the right thing. They say, Luke, now I know exactly who they mean. Or if they say Anakin, I know who they mean. Or if they say Anakin Skywalker, even better. Uh, because now I only get one match. And what I'm trying to do is basically narrow their responses down to get one match so that I'm confident that I can give them the answer they're looking for. Uh, so lots and lots of cool stuff we can do with slots. And as I mentioned, I'm replacing these every time I ask the user a new question. So I'm dynamically updating what the slot value is so that when they ask, when I ask them the question, the only possible match is the right answer. Um, and that makes it very, very easy for me to know that they got it correct. Anyway, that's a lot in a browser. Lots of really cool tools here uh, for building your interfaces, for testing. Um, but this is a JavaScript user group, so I feel like I shouldn't do all of my work in a browser. So what I'm gonna do instead is jump over here and uh, we're gonna do some we're gonna do some coding. So uh, the first thing that I'm gonna show you is that there's an ask CLI. So I'm gonna say ask new. Um, ask stands for Alexa skills kit and that's what all of this technology is. So I'm using the, the CLI to get started here. And I'm gonna say no JS cause that's my flavor of choice. And then we get a couple of choices here. Alexa hosted and AWS Lambda are the most common. Um, but if you, you know, if you're down with AWS CloudFormation that's certainly a way to go as well. Um, Alexa hosted is really nice because you can build your skill and they set up Lambda, they set up an S3 bucket, they set up um, DynamoDB for you. And it's not even on your account. You don't pay for it. They provision all of those things for you and you still have full access to all of them. You can change the code, you can manipulate, man modify however you want, but you don't have to worry about the costs that are in incurred by them. Now, if your code explodes, all of a sudden you've got a really popular skill or um, you're just blowing up for some reason, they will gently contact you and say, hey, you know what, it's time to move to AWS, but it's, it's pretty aggressive to get to those kind of limits. So for the most part, most applications can just live in this Alexa hosted skills kind of free tier without ever having to worry about having to graduate. The other side, the one that I'm gonna use right now is AWS Lambda. Now I already have the AWS CLI installed on my machine. And so I do a lot of other stuff with AWS where I'm pushing stuff around and I use the CLI to do that. So I'm gonna use AWS Lambda um, as my backend and then I can push all my stuff to Lambda separately. I have a Lambda function that's part of my account. This especially makes sense if 
Uh, maybe your company wants to own all of your code and your services in their own cloud. Um, this is a good way to do that. So I choose Lambda. Uh, I choose a template. There's, uh, there's four that they start you with. I'm going to choose Hello World just because it's super simple. Um, and then I have to give it a name. Um, I like the very convenient Delete Me. Uh, we'll use that as the name of my application. Um, we'll create a folder for that. It's going ahead and it's creating all of that stuff. And so now if I go to Delete Me, uh, sorry, Delete Me, we can now see inside that folder that I have uh, an infrastructure folder, a Lambda folder, and the skill package folder. So the first thing I'll show you is CD Lambda. Um, and in there we have an index, a package.json, and a util.js. So the key things here are um, the index file primarily. This is this is the file that is that your application is going to be hit when um, when that package comes in from Alexa. So this is the file that needs to catch all of that stuff. So let's do this. Let's come over here. We'll open our folder. Uh, go to uh, where did it go? Oh no, I put it in the wrong place. I put it here. Not where I meant to put it, but that's fine for now. Uh, so I, this is an easier way to just navigate and show you what's going on. So in my index file, there's already a bunch of starter code there for me, uh, but let me give you a quick tour of the other things that are here. We have a skill package. This is where my interaction model lives. This is, as you saw earlier, we have intents. This is how we define all of those things. So I have a cancel, help, and stop intent. I have a hello world intent, which is what the basic template comes with. And that's pretty much it. That's all that's there. This navigate home intent is meant for devices that have screens to go back to whatever your home screen might be for your application. But we, we're not gonna worry about for that for tonight. Uh, so we have cancel help stop in this hello world intent. Uh, in our Lambda, you can see that we have these handlers, these little chunks right here. Uh, I have a launch request handler. I have the hello world intent handler. Uh, we have a help and a cancel and a, a cancel and stop I've kind of merged. Uh, but all of these individual chunks are decisions. Uh, and the way that this uh, file is structured, this is using the Alexa Skills Kit SDK and so what we're really doing is building out a library of handlers. Uh, it processes them in this order. And so it starts with launch request, then goes to hello world on and on. And so the way these are set up is they initially return a Boolean value. So we have a can handle function. This is what determines whether or not it can handle the request that's coming in. And so in this case, we say, is the type of this request a launch request? If it is, then yeah, I can handle that. And then we're gonna go do whatever is in this handle function. Uh, if it's not, then it's going to move on to the next one, which in that list was the hello world intent handler. And in this case, it's going to say, is it an intent request? And is the intent the hello world intent? If those both return true, then we're going to go do this code. Uh, and it slowly moves, well, quickly moves through that process to figure out which, in, which handler am I supposed to fall into? We also have a bonus one that sits down here at the bottom that is the intent reflector handler. And this is here for development. I don't generally recommend um, that this goes to production. But basically, if you try to hit an intent that you haven't written any code for yet, this will catch it and say, hey, you just hit this intent, but you haven't written any code for it yet. So um, that, is, um, that is the purpose of the intent reflector. And you can see that uh, at, the, at the end of our list, that's the last one. So it should have tried all of the other things before it ever gets to that one. Uh, we'll ask the question, are those auto-generated or is it a can template? Um, the template that I use to start this um, is a can template. It's just our standard hello world template. In fact, it's available on GitHub if you want to go play with it or fork it or whatever. Um, but yeah, those four templates are just there. You can also, there's a command in the, in the CLI that would allow you to point to your own GitHub repository. So if you, if you have a pre-canned Alexa template that you like to start with that has these handlers and uses the SDK and gets everything the way exactly you like it, um, you can point to a GitHub repository of your choice also. And in fact, on my GitHub, I have... Uh, not there. Somewhere in here, I thought I thought I had it near the top. Um, come on, come on, come on. Alexa skill template. So this is a template that I built for myself. It's a little out of date for me now. Uh, so I need to go up and re-update re it. But basically, I can just point directly at this Git repository and use this as the template that I start with. Um, and I just, all you have to do is just go to the repository. And I think it's, you just use this address. Um, that's all you have to point to. So it's, it's pretty simple. Anyway, great question, Will, thank you. Um, so it processes these individual commands. So as an example, if I wanted to take this, I could say, um, welcome to the Columbus JS meetup. 
we can save that. Now I haven't done anything with this code yet. So the other thing that I'm gonna to wanna to do is, let's go, come on Linux, there we go. Um, I can say ask deploy because I haven't done this yet. What I have told it so far is that, hey, I wanna build this new skill and I wanna use AWS Lambda, but I haven't actually deployed anything yet. This is all still local on my machine. So when I say ask deploy, what this is gonna do is it's going to then reach out to the Alexa developer portal, that website that I was showing you, and it's gonna build a new skill for me. It's gonna create all that stuff up there for me. Um, once it's done with that, this will take a minute and a half maybe because there's really nothing to what we've built so far. Um, once it's done that, it also has to build all of that because remember all of those sample utterances, all those intents that we've built, all of that stuff needs to be able to have the machine learning engine applied to it. And so that's building. So we're gonna go ahead and build all of that stuff too. Once that's done, um, and it should be here any moment, it'll then move on and start working on the uh, AWS Lambda stuff. And that's where it's gonna push all of my Lambda code up to a brand new Lambda function in my own AWS account, because it uses the um, AWS SDK in, uh, in its mechanisms to be able to deploy all that stuff. So it already knows who I am and has all my security credentials and all that kind of stuff. All right, so now we're building the code itself. Um, then it's deploying it. That should happen here in just a second. Maybe, please don't choke. Uh, it doesn't choke. I, I just don't know what it's doing right now. This is the first time I've done this since I installed the um, Windows subsystem for Linux. So I'm nervously watching all of this stuff happen and hoping that it actually does. But it looks like it is. It found my it found my region. It's creating, it created the new Lambda function. It's updating the skill package. Uh, it's zipping everything up. It should push all that stuff up. I don't recommend this being your development process. I'll show you some cool stuff we can do to make our development faster. Because uh, if you had to do this every time you made a change, this would be a nightmare. But um, at least to get everything created and deployed, this is a good first step before we move on. So almost there, almost there. Come on. All right, skill is enabled successfully. So there's a, there's a couple of good pieces of news about this. The first is, and I just wanna show you this, if I come back to the developer portal that we were in earlier and I go back to my skills, you can see that I now have a brand new skill called delete me. This is the thing that we just created. Uh, so I can come in here and I can use all the tools that you just saw a second ago where uh, I can test it, uh, I can build my interaction model, I can play with all this stuff, but keep in mind that you're working on two different versions. So, um, if you make changes here and then you go back to your local development and you hit ask deploy, you're going to overwrite all of your changes. So there's a couple of ways that I can help you mitigate that, but there's a couple of questions. So I wanna make sure I answer those two. Will asked, how does it work with foreign accents? And um, it works really well with foreign accents, especially if you go through what we call voice training. In the Alexa app, um, you can set it up so that it, it prompts you to go through about five or six sentences um, and it asks you to read them. And once it's heard you and able to capture how you speak those sentences, uh, it tailors it. And I'll tell you a quick quick example story. Uh, there's a football player that used to play for Seattle, uh, the Seattle uh, Seahawks football team. And uh, because Amazon is in Seattle, we were doing some work with him and his, he has some, some local stores and malls there. And he wanted to bring Alexa into his stores. And so uh, we were sitting down and we were showing him how to use it. And he could not hear the difference between Alexa, sorry for saying it, and um, the name Alexis. And so we would say, yeah, yeah, why don't you try to open the skill? And so he'd say, Alexis, this, and Alexis, that. And we're like, no, 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 it's Alexa. And he goes, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And you just, you could not convince him he wasn't saying the other thing. Um, and so he was struggling with it a little bit. So we had one of his people take him through that voice training and instantly it understood, because it wasn't just Alexis. He was saying some other words that were slightly different than what we wanted him to say. Um, but whether it's on purpose, um, like he may have been doing, or if people have speech impediments or accents or whatever it may be, in any of those cases, by using that speech training, it lets Alexa know how you're saying those words so that she can better interpret it for you. Uh, but that being said, um, you can also set it up so that you say like, hey, I actually wanna be in the UK um, voice. And then it'll also speak to you with a UK voice or an Australian accent uh, if you'd prefer. So there's lots of that kind of things that you can do. Um, there's one more thing I want to show before I get too much too deep into these questions, but these are fantastic questions. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to show you here is that there's also, if you use VS Code, which I think a lot of us do anymore, um, there's a fantastic plugin called the Alexa Skills Toolkit. 
And in here, one of the ways that I use to get that interaction model, because I really like this tool, like coming in here and being able to build out my intents and um, like clicking and adding things to it. This is so much more convenient than like manually editing a JSON document. So in here, my interaction model, I can say download. Uh, and what I can actually do is download the interaction model. So if I made any changes up there, it goes, grabs it, brings it back down here, puts it exactly in the place that it's supposed to be. And all I have to do is say save. And now it is overwritten the file that's local. Um, super, super powerful and a, a nice way to make sure that you're, you're staying in sync. So it's nice to be able to go use the tool and then just rip that stuff back down without having to copy and paste or do anything weird like that. Uh, but in here, I can do all sorts of things, including testing my skill. So we have a simulator built right in here. So you saw the one that was in the browser. This looks pretty similar, but I can say um, open change me, I think is what it's called. And it should say, you can say hello or no, this should actually say Welcome to the Columbus JS meetup, maybe? No, I don't know what the opening name for is. I didn't set that, um, but I have I have a simulator sitting here as well. So all of this stuff is possible to work entirely just inside VS Code without ever really having to go to the cloud at all. Um, so that was the stuff I wanted to show you. The, the, the key to building stuff for voice is to think really deeply about what are the things people are gonna say, build a really robust interaction model that includes intents and slots, um, and then build the code to handle those situations and persist the data that's necessary. And then it's just a loop, right? You, uh, you go from the user saying something to you saying something back, user saying something, user, you say something back, and you just continue to bounce that back and forth. And the more robust uh, and the more context you can use and the more clues you can use to get the user where they wanna go, when they wanna go there, um, that's when you find your success in a, a good voice experience. So another really good question here though, um, which is can skills distinguish between different speakers responding to the same device? Even if anonymous could be interesting to know that someone different just responded to a user session than the speaker who responded before. Yes, that is absolutely possible. That's another thing you can set up in your account is what we call speaker ID or voice ID. Uh, it's a little bit like people think of like voice fingerprinting where, um, and I'll give you a good example of this. Uh, if I have my device here, I can say, um, Alexa, who am I? I'm talking to Jeff. This is Jeff's account. Now I'm gonna to switch to my wife's account. Alexa, switch accounts. Now in Sarah Blankenberg's account. Alexa, who am I? I think you're Jeff. This is Sarah Blankenberg's account. Alexa, switch accounts. Now in Jeff's account. Okay, so hopefully what you got to see there is that it's able to recognize that it's me speaking and that doesn't necessarily apply to who owns the account because I'm jumping between those two accounts and it's still like, wait, you're Jeff. Now we can set things up to say, I only want this speaker to be able to uh, be able to interact, uh, especially when you're thinking about things that are a little more secure. Um, so if you want people to like, for example, if my son walks up to the device and he's like, order a hundred thousand Lego. Well, I don't really want him to be able to do that. So I could say purchasing is locked down. So it's only with my voice, right? And so anything that happens on my account could only be my voice. But on my wife, if she left that open, I could go in and order a bunch of stuff on her account. Um, so it's it's up to the individual user. And I think by default, purchasing is set to the only the speaker. Once you set up your voice, it's set to be only you. Um, but you, you as the user have full control over this stuff. That's something that Amazon really focuses on is making sure the customer feels like they're in control. Uh, and so we want to give you as much as con much control as we possibly can. So that's the quick run through on kind of building Alexa stuff. I mean, I could get much deeper into like actually taking apart our index.js and breaking pieces apart. I guess the last piece that I would cover if I was gonna talk about anything is this little chunk here. This is specific to the SDK, but there's there's two pieces that are important, which are the speak and the reprompt functions. Speak takes a string and it's whatever you wanna say to the user. So whatever you pass through the speak function is what's going to be said to the user. And you can pass sound effects, you can put all sorts of neat stuff in there. Um, that's also, um, oh, no, that's enough to say for now. So then reprompt is, it's a, it's a weird concept to think about in your head. Reprompt takes a string that only gets spoken if the user doesn't respond to what we said in speak. Does that make sense? So if I were to walk up to Guy and I was like, hey Guy, how's it going? And he says nothing to me, I might come back after a few seconds and be like, oh, I, maybe you didn't hear me. I was just wondering how things are going. How's that beard of yours? Right, and like try to get him to, come at me with some kind of response. 
And if he doesn't respond a second time, then Alexa says, oh, we're not talking, turns off the microphone and closes the session. If the user does respond though, if they do respond to the speak, whatever we said for speak, they'll never even hear the reprompt. That never gets said. It's only provided if the user doesn't respond the first time. But the key to this is if you don't provide a reprompt, Alexa doesn't listen at all. So if you only provide a speak, Alexa will be like, the weather outside is sunny, and then closes the session. That's the end. That's, we're done. So it's important to include a reprompt every single time because otherwise the user's gonna get what, they, what you said and then nothing else. They're gonna have to open your skill again. So the reprompt is your opportunity to listen again and again and again. Uh, and that's, again, that's how you build that loop by forcing a question back on the user every single time. Oh, okay, I heard you want a pizza. What toppings do you want on it? Oh, I heard you say pepperoni. Is that all? Like you're just constantly throwing questions back at them to get them to continue to the conversation. So again, from here, uh, and this is something that's really important. Once you're in Node, once you're in your service, you can do literally anything you could ever do in Node. Um, so it doesn't really matter that much. The only real rule you have is that you have to respond within eight seconds. So you're not gonna call off and build some giant report and wait for 30 seconds. Um, these have to be fast running services. And if you need to kick something off, Alexa get, has mechanisms for you to say, hey, I started that report for you. I'll let you know when it's ready. And then you could send a notification to the user when that report has run, which took six minutes or whatever. So there's still ways to handle those things too. Um, so we have uh, 13 minutes left. Wow, I went a little long. Uh, what other questions do you all have for me? You mentioned just a second ago that uh, you're, you're giving an example where someone provides a command or says something and then uh, asynchronously sometime later, an alert goes back to them. Yeah. Um, is that structured any different? Like you're, you're working in a project here, you're showing those intents that come in. Oh, so right, right, right. Processing it, it, of alerts going out. Fall yeah, the it is structured, structured slightly differently. So there's one more function on here, which is uh, set, get. Uh, I never typed this. I always just copy and paste it because uh, I use it so frequently. Add. Add? No, it's not add. Why can't I remember what this is? Let's go look at a different code base. <laughs> My apologies. Um, if I go in here and I look at this one, where would be a good example of this? We'll just open that folder. Um, handler, I have it in here. So what we do with this is you can see here that I'm creating uh, right here, I'm creating an object that is this APL directive. This is a this is an example of pushing stuff to the screen, but this is the same way that most of those other kinds of functionality happen, uh, like sending notifications. So we create this object that is a, a, in this case, it's a render document. This is gonna be instructions for what to put on the screen. Um, and then down here at the bottom, yeah, it's add directive. See, I knew what I was talking about. It's add directive. Um, and I just pass in whatever that JSON document is that has all the instructions for what I wanna do. So. Um, it might be an APL document that is what to put on the screen. It might be a notification. It could be a combination of both. Um, but yeah, so you can see I have speak, I have reprompt, and in this case, I have add directive. And there's lots and lots of directives. Um, if I do something like uh, the buy category intent, you can see that this is a, uh, a directive for buying something in my skill. You saw I bought that um, technology category when we were looking at my, my trivia game. So I sent this into the service and actually the, the entire purchase process that I went through is actually not handled by my skill. It's handled by the Alexa service. What I do is send it a, a product ID that I previously registered and it knows what the price of that is. It knows the name and the description and all the other stuff. Um, and so uh, all I do is say, hey, I'm trying to sell this user this product ID, go do the thing. It tries to sell them that product and the user either does or doesn't buy it. And I handle all of those kinds of responses back to my skill, which is things like buy declined, right? So in this case, I say, oh, you didn't want to buy that. That's cool. Uh, what would you like to do instead, right? So I'm handling all of those different scenarios. Um, do I have guidelines on how to best mix up responses so Alexa doesn't always reply with the same phrasing? I feel like, Simon, you are teeing me up for an incredible story that I had to tell because that is exactly what I'm doing right here. Uh, you can see in this case that I have a function called get random speech. Uh, and instead of having hard-coded speech written in here that says something like, oh, your purchase, you didn't decide to buy it or whatever, um, what I do instead, I mentioned that I use Airtable. Um, I use it for one specific reason, and that's because I often collaborate with other people that are not technical. They're not data, database people like I am. Uh, and so I want to give them a very easy interface to dive into. 
this table interface is amazing for people that want to be able to just dive in and make some simple updates without having to really understand much about how it works. And so what you can see that I've done in here is that I have different speech types. So I have things like action queries and category full list prompt. Each one of these different speech types is a different piece of speech that I use inside the skill. Um, you know, I can see I have three different error messages. I have tons and tons of goodbyes. By the way, just a little side note, did you guys know, in addition to like see you later alligator and after a while crocodile, there's also a bunch of other animal ones like chow chow brown cow and gotta go buffalo. There's a butterfly one in here somewhere. Um, give a hug ladybug, bye bye butterfly. The, I didn't even know those all existed. It's amazing. Uh, anyway, so these are all goodbyes. So when you leave the skill, it randomly picks one of these. So what my function does is it comes and it grabs some of this data um, and pulls a random one out for me and uses that. Um, and uh, you could also use a red, Redis set of stock phrases and have a Redis pick a random one for you. Totally, yeah. I, like there isn't any bad answer here. Uh, I'm just trying to show that like, this is an easy way to let people that are not technical come in and add content for me. Uh, the same goes for my questions, right? I have a question database. They can come in here, they can say, oh, this is a technology question. Here's the question, here's the answer. Um, Here's some additional, like I have this voice answer note. So uh, like for the example, if you're using a penny farthing, what type of transportation are you using? Well, the answer is bicycle. Um, but then I also give you some information about like, why is it called a penny farthing, right? So um, it came from the British penny and farthing coins. One, one was marked larger than the other. And then I have synonyms, which are things that sound like that or might be other answers for the, the actual answer. Uh, so I keep all of this in one place and then I can just pluck the things that I need as I need them. Um, but Airtable is not actually the solution. It's just a place that I store all the data, uh, but this is how I do it. So in all of my code, there's no speech anywhere in my code. Uh, all of it is get random speech from a specific speech type. And then it jumps into my table and says, oh, they want a speech con correct? Cool, we're gonna say right oh this time. I think the time we got our trivia question right, she said cha-ching, right? So that was this one right here. Can I zoom in totally? So that's the table structure. This is the actual speech that will get used. And this is a, this is a markup language called SSML. Uh, think of it like HTML. Um, and you just mark up the speech. Like, hey, I want you to make this more exciting. So when you put this interjection around it, there's a thousand or so words that can be more exciting, like alrighty, instead of just like alrighty, right? She adds emotion to it. Um, Doug says, if someone uses the word ranger, they could be talking about the National Park Service, a sports team or Lord of the Rings. What help does Alexa have for disentangling that? Well, the good news on all of this is that you kind of are in control of this. So generally for something like Ranger, this is a value that you're expecting. Um, so you already know the context. You might have a list of movies or you might have a list of sports teams or you might have a list of park services or uh, park services jobs. Uh, and so what happens is the user is going to say, tell me about Ranger. And depending on what your skill does and the slot that you've built, I can show you one of my slots as well. We'll go look at the trivia game again, because that has much more obvious slots. If I come down to my slot types here, you can see that I have a category. This is a good example. So the categories of my trivia game are, there's 20 different categories, and you can see them listed here on the left. Art and stage, business world, design, film, food and drink. And then I also have synonyms for those because they may not remember to say art and stage, but they know it's like theater-ish. So they might say theater or give me trivia about plays, right? Or um, maybe they only remember one of the words. So any of these synonyms will also trigger the same entry. But the key for you is to build slots that represent the kinds of data that you're expecting. And so another good example of this might be my uh, casino. If we look at this one, I have some good slot values for this as well. So for these slot types, you can see I have things like card suits, clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades. Those are the four values that I'm expecting. If they say, give me the seven of tacos, I shouldn't know what to do with that. Um, but to disambiguate what version of Ranger they meant is often hap it often happens um, that you're going to be able to recognize that it doesn't match your data. And so what Doug is asking is, suppose there's one skill for sports and a different skill for Lord of the Rings trivia. Okay, so now what you're asking is, how does it know which skill to open? That's a different question, which is fine. You may not have realized that. But if, there, if you're talking about getting into which skill, and each skill is just called Ranger, initially, 
and this is where it gets really tricky. Initially, the service itself, the machine learning engine of Alexa is going to recommend one to you. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily know your context. Um, so if the skill is just called Ranger, that might be a little tricky, but if it's called Hockey Ranger or something like that, then you, then you have a better chance of being found. That's actually one of the reasons that we require that the invocation name, the name of your skill has to have at least two words. Um, that rule is breakable. If you're like a, uh, you have something copyrighted like Starbucks. Well, yeah, you can have one word if you're Starbucks, but if you are just me or you or whatever, and we're just building a cool thing, has to at least be two words. But on top of that, when you ask for a skill, it's going to first look at the list of skills you've ever used before. Um, so it considers the ones that you've enabled uh, to be kind of the ones that we're going to focus on first. And if it can't find one there, then it's going to recommend one to you. And what it's going to say is, oh, I found something you might like. It's this. And if it's not the one you're looking for, you can say no and she'll recommend more. But it's generally irresponsible to build a skill that is only one vague word like Ranger uh, because you're going to catch a lot of stuff you weren't expecting. Um, and you're also going to miss out on people that may not have known exactly how to find you. So I generally recommend having a more specific name, but there, there would not be, in your example, if there were two skills called Ranger, one about Lord of the Rings and one about hockey teams, um, it would not necessarily know the difference um, because it, the user isn't giving them any context. It's all based on user context and there isn't any in that specific example. But it'll do its very best to try to accommodate you. And I would imagine that the engine is context aware enough to realize that this person really loves sports uh, based on other activities that they've done that maybe will lean towards sports or if they're really into fantasy and maybe Dungeons and Dragons and some other stuff, maybe maybe it's more likely they want Lord of the Rings trivia. Um, and there are some mechanisms behind the scenes that we call name-free invocation, which are ways for developers. It's kind of like um, search engine optimization where you can say, here's a bunch of other stuff people might say that kind of refers to what I do. Um, and that goes through certification and stuff. So you're not going to get to like lie about it, but it's a, it's another mechanism we have for people to make sure they end up in the right place. I hope that, uh, hope that answers your question. My gosh, it's already eight. I've been talking for an hour. Guy, this has been awesome. Are, are there any other questions? I'll flip to this. Hopefully that answered a bunch of your questions. Um, and like I said, like a uh, guy mentioned earlier and I did as well, uh, I do a ton of live streaming. So I am on every morning, 10 to noon Eastern on Twitch. And you can find me at my username, Jeff Blankenberg. Um, I'm also happy to answer your questions. If you just want to reach out to me on Twitter or whatever, uh, my Twitter inbox is completely read and responded to. I cannot say the same for my email inbox. Um, on top of that, uh, we also run Alexa office hours every Tuesday at noon Eastern. And so if you just want a live place to come in and ask me some questions at a time, you know, I'm going to be doing it anyway. It's on Twitch. It's on YouTube. You can find me there uh, noon, noon Eastern. Uh, and that's on the Alexa developers channel. But um, in either case, I'm always happy. If you guys have questions, that's my job. I'm here to help. So let me know how I can help. Okay. We, Are there any other questions? Sure, uh, I'll shoot. Um, where's the best place to start if you're new to this? Um, if you're new, to, if you're new to voice, or are you also new to JavaScript? Uh, new to voice. Okay. Um, what I would recommend, honestly, is there there are a number of tutorials. Um, so you can go to developer.alexa. Actually, let me see if I can get you a. The best place to go, I'm going to drop it in the chat, is um, Alexa.designs slash start. Um, this is a page that we have set up specifically for you to be able to go and like learn about all the pieces and how they all work. Um, but there's honestly a number of GitHub repositories at the Alexa GitHub um, that have enough instruction that if you know JavaScript and you're just trying to figure out how this stuff fits together, um, I think that that's a really good place. But the page that I just sent you to, alexa.design slash start, um, is where we have all of our like official tutorials and all that stuff but you may find pretty quickly that you're like, God, this is too basic. Like, I just want to know how that thing goes. So like, it's up to you, but um, the GitHub repositories are mentioned on here. So you'll find them as you go through. Thank you. Sure, Dean, no problem.
Anybody else? Uh, their stunned silence is very reassuring. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I've answered all their questions. So. It should also be mentioned, if, if I didn't mention this earlier, I am based here in Columbus. And so once this world can open back up, I hope I get a chance to, one, come to this meeting more often uh, and meet some of you folks in, per in person. I'm looking forward to that very much. Yes. <laughs> yes, very much. Rumor has it I might be able to get a, a vaccine as early as Tuesday. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. Well, if there are any other questions, then uh, I'm going to go ahead and shut off the stream and thank everyone for attending. Uh, we can hang out after and uh, talk about whatever. We don't have to talk about Alexa. Uh, we'll, you know, hang out for the next hour or so if, if yeah. people want or, you know, drop off, whatever you want to do. It's all uh, up to you. <laughs> I, I hate to be that guy, but I can't stick around. Uh, okay. I have a thing I have to do here at 8.15 and then I have, uh, I'm doing uh, like recording some podcast at nine. It's a full evening. Oh, well, it sounds like we should let you go then and uh, give you a round of virtual applause. And uh, thank you everybody. I appreciate thanks it. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you coming out and uh, everyone on Twitter. Uh, thanks for watching and everyone on YouTube. Thanks for watching this uh, recorded. Uh, see you all later. Bye everybody.